Thanks very much for joining us again and for making the time. Welcome everyone to Voices of Wentworth. I'm Kath Naish um, and I'd like to start by acknowledging that I'm on the land of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation and by paying my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. Now, last February, Voices of Wentworth held a discussion with you, Anthony, and Helen Haynes, the Federal MP for Indi, on the proposals for the National Integrity Commission. And we are very privileged to be joined by you again today. You're a former New South Wales Court of Appeal judge and the chair of the Centre for Public Integrity, which is pursuing an integrity reform agenda to increase public trust in our democracy. Now, the Prime Minister and the former Attorney General made a commitment to introduce a National Integrity Commission back in 2018 and again in 2019 prior to the last federal election. But at the moment, all we have from the government is an exposure draft. We still don't have a government bill. We have a bill from Helen Haynes, which has been introduced to Parliament and is on the notice paper, but has not yet been debated. So we've got a situation where there's really not much happening on progress with bringing legislation in. So to start off with, and just to provide some context for our conversation today, could you just remind our viewers of the sorts of activities which would warrant investigation by a federal integrity commission? Yes, well, I mean, let me just give, as it were, a, a general statement first, and that is one, one person's idea of corruption won't be necessarily another person's idea. So uh, one definition says that corruption is something that's a criminal offence, but we favour a much broader definition, which would embrace criminal misbehaviour, but would go well beyond it. For example, uh, we believe that any conduct, any person that could directly or indirectly affect the efficacy or probity of public administration would be regarded by the community as corruption. So, for example, perhaps the best known one in the last 12 to 14 months was the uh, scandal known as the sports rot scandal. Uh, and this was, uh, just to remind people, a situation where uh, money was to be handed out on a lavish scale uh, to sporting bodies to assist them with perhaps building a, a grandstand, putting in lights, putting down playing fields, improving amenities, uh, providing uh, facilities for women's sport and so on. All laudable ideas, of course, in themselves. And in order to test uh, which were the uh, most uh, uh, deserving of applicants for this type of grant, the Sports Commission was by statute directed to inquire and make a series of recommendations to the government. That was done. Uh, there were quite a few highly recommended uh, applicants. Uh, others were middling, if you like, and some were not favoured. Uh, now, instead of the Minister, Bridget McKenzie, following those recommendations, as uh, she, really uh, she was required to do, uh, instead, as the Auditor General found, uh, she ignored the recommendations and replaced them with um, a series of grants that favoured or targeted uh, electoral seats uh, that were acquired by the government at the forthcoming election. So in other words, it was pork barrelling on a grand scale and deliberately done, spent expenditure of an enormous amount of public money uh, to try and win the next election. And that's a classic example of what we would say is activity that falls within the broader definition of corruption. It may not be criminal, mind you. It's not far from it. It could be misconduct in public office, but it certainly would be a breach of ministerial standards uh, and a very good example of the of the conduct we say should be investigated by an anti-corruption agency at a federal level. And such a, you know, it's not just a question of picking out one particular type of activity like that one. Uh, we, we need to go a little bit further and say that uh, an eminent academic like Professor Ann Toomey has written a very valuable paper recently and published it, which makes the point that constitutionally, the federal government can't expend enormous amounts of money willy-nilly or as it pleases. It can only do so if it's permitted by the constitution. And the amounts of money that were spent and the direction in which they were spent 
were probably not authorised by the Constitution at all. But secondly, more importantly, uh, as Professor Toomey points out in this article, uh, uh, Bridget McKenzie not have the power to override the Sports Commission's recommendations. And so it became a much more serious um, uh, breach of ministerial standards in, in, in her view. There's a lot of other other examples as well, which we could run through. But what I really want to talk to you about is your recent meeting with Dave Sharma, who's the federal MP for Wentworth. And I understand that you met with him to discuss the progress on the federal ICAC legislation. Um, can you let us know how that meeting went and what you discussed and what his position uh, is? I was there with um, Ben Oakwest of the Australian Institute and uh, the Honourable Mary Gordon, who was a former judge of the High Court of Australia. And we um, ha had a very pleasant conversation. Mr Sharma is a very amiable man. But the more we discussed this issue, uh, the more concerned I became. Uh, first of all, he said that the government considered that only criminal offences should be investigated by a federal body. We pointed out many uh, decisions that are made by the government um, are made for political purposes and that raises the question of whether they're decisions that are made for a partisan reason perhaps not permitted by the constitution and also uh, perhaps um, um, perhaps involving uh, like the sports rort scandal a breach of ministerial standards so Dave Sharma said to me uh, and, and to, to the others who were there uh, he said, we don't believe that um, leaving aside criminal matters, any of our decisions should be investigated by an external body. We believe that the decisions we make um, should be scrutinised by the electorate at election time and, and, and only then. And if they don't like what we've decided, uh, they can vote for the other side. We pointed out to him that that is just so incorrect and that it leads to uh, years of decision making, which may be very suspect indeed. And later on, um, I asked Dave Sharma whether I could repeat what he had said publicly. And he said that he was quite pleased for us to do so, that his opinions were opinions he held publicly and he didn't mind them being repeated. So I have repeated them. And the, what I've just said to you is a fair summary, I believe, what he told us. It's pretty disappointing to hear that because there are obviously a lot of issues which voters care about and to be told that you only have one opportunity to make your voice heard on every single issue once every three yes. years when there's an election yes. is not really good enough um, mm. when the regular polling shows that issues like integrity in Parliament and um, climate action and a number of other issues rate very highly. But if they're competing with issues such as the economy or COVID or whatever it is, that those issues may be over overshadowed. And that's not a satisfactory response to say, well, if you don't like it, you can vote us out at the next election, particularly when we've got all kinds of concerns around the way that elections are being held and run and um, the sort of misinformation that's being spread around the time of elections as well. So it's quite a surprising um, lack of engagement from Dave Sharma on that issue and certainly one which at Voices of Wentworth will raise with him. Um, but thank you for having the meeting with him and um, it's good to get that information back to voters so that they know where he stands. I agree yeah. with you very much. And I make a further point, that, that um, scrutinising government decisions at election time is the worst possible time to do it. And that's because the, um, the public are not informed uh, by what's happened. They can't go behind the decisions. They can't look carefully at what really has happened in the way that an, an anti-corruption agency can. They have to take things as they are on the surface. And as we know, on the surface, these decisions are accompanied by a good deal of spin. And we also know that election times, um, there are time exaggeration, manipulation, advertising uh, scandalously and ignoring the truth. So you couldn't get a worse time to try and assess uh, the intentions made by the government than 
than than election time, in my opinion. And I think you're right in making that, that point. Yeah, absolutely. And and if if an if an independent integrity body was doing its job properly and 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 establishing and investigating and establishing instances of corruption or or not, as the case may be, that information needs to be available to voters well before an election. So they've got an ability to assess whether they whether they have trust or faith in in the people who they're electing. So yeah, I, it's not just something that we talk about at election time. I'm, I'm completely in agreement with you on that. Um, and we now have a new Attorney General, Michaelia Cash. Do you think that affects the prospects of seeing any government legislation being put forward before the next election, which at the moment we don't know when that's going to be, if it might be sometime this year or, or, or early next year? Um, or in your view, has the government just abandoned its promise to deliver the federal ICAC? What's going to happen with that legislation? It seems they have abandoned it, and, and I think the evidence for that is that in the recent budget, uh, they had uh, various um, allowances made for staff. They made an allowance of exactly naught dollars. So that means that for now and after the forthcoming election, they have no intention of implementing any promise made in the past uh, to start up uh, an integrity body. And the second piece of evidence I think that is very powerful is in relation to their model for a Commonwealth Integrity Commission, a very flawed model, I might say, and they've received copious submissions many, many months ago, and yet we've heard nothing about a response to those submissions. So I don't think they're interested in having uh, an integrity body. It's, it's a great shame to say that, because they did um, ultimately two years ago, two and a little bit years ago, promise that they would now look at this seriously, but they haven't done so. And I don't think they've got the intention uh, at any time in the immediate future of installing such a body. I mean, frankly, they don't want it. As, da as Dave Sharma's uh, comments show, they don't really want to be accountable or to be scrutinized by an independent third party body. Do you think that they understand that in a democracy, that's part of their job to be subjected to scrutiny and to be accountable and transparent to the electorate? Or do they just not understand that? Well, sad as it is to say, I think that uh, events over the last 12 months, uh, COVID uh, arrival, um, have demonstrated that this government does not wish to be accountable really in any sense. Uh, we've not seen any apologies for mistakes that have been made. Uh, we've not seen ministers resigning uh, when uh, ministerial responsibility would normally dictate to, that that should happen. Uh, and we've seen a good deal of spin uh, covering up decisions. Uh, in addition to that, when uh, that requires an investigation, it's not done independently. Uh, the Chief of Staff, for example, of the Prime Minister's office will conduct an inquiry. We're usually not told the detail of the results of that inquiry, simply that somebody or other's been exonerated. And, and all of that added together demonstrates to me that more and more, this government does not believe in being accountable. And as you say, Kath, that's a very significant start in the decaying process for a flourishing democracy. Which is something that we're very concerned about, those of us who are watching closely. and um, not sure that the general population is as concerned about it, at least not at the moment. Um, so anyway, that's just something that I guess we're trying to keep some focus on. Let, let's be honest um, about uh, the, you know, countries where democracy is being degraded much more significantly than in Australia. But this is an example of fraying around the edges and, and it's, it's very unedifying and it's worrying because if this trend continues, uh, the democratic processes will gradually be eroded in Australia. And of course, you know, democracy is very hard won and, and it shouldn't be taken for granted and, and we don't want to be in a situation where we're trying to get it back. <laughs> um, we want to make sure that we protect it. But some, some of the moderate um, government backbenchers have been speaking out a bit recently in, on certain issues. So, 
for example, on the ongoing detention of the family from Bilawea, um, which is interesting to see. And without naming any names, and I know you've given us Dave Sharma's position, but are you aware of any government backbenchers who do support the introduction of um, an, an integrity commission? Or is it sort of across the board, just nobody's interested in talking about it? Well, I think I think you're wise not to ask me to name any names, but I think that, uh, that there are indications that there are two, maybe three people, um, government backbenchers, uh, who see the folly uh, of continuing to exist without a proper anti-corruption body. Uh, Helen Haynes and others are working behind the scenes uh, to make the point that surely there are those who have sufficient conscience uh, in the coalition uh, to support her bill, for example, and, and, and to vote down uh, the government's proposed model. It hasn't come to a bill before Parliament yet, but if it does, I doubt that it will, but if it does, I think there are you know, two or three people who may uh, be prepared to stand up and be counted in this regard. We hope so. That's encouraging to hear. And, you know, traditionally the Liberal Party, you would expect to see people making their voices heard on those sorts of issues and it's been less the case in recent years but um there's nothing this stopping them from yeah taking a position well let's hope so uh, as i say there are good people working behind the scene and and let's hope that uh, it'll bear fruit so in the meantime, how can we keep this issue in the front of people's minds? Because it's not something that the government talks about. It's not something that gets rolled out in the media cycle. It's, um, in our view, one of the top priorities for the next federal election, talking about integrity in politics. We, our view is that without integrity, you don't have properly functioning democracy. Um, without democracy, you can't fix things. You can't get things done. So we're trying very hard to keep it in people's minds um, and not only that but to ensure that a, as soon as possible really effective legislation is passed by the federal parliament it's not looking likely before the next election but it's not an issue that we want to see disappearing from the public discourse so have you got any tips for how we can keep people keep this in people's mind as the news cycle continues to turn rapidly uh, and new topics come forward. I think all we can do is persist, but I think we can be pretty sure that scandals will not dissipate. Uh, there will be further scandals between now and the next election. And each time something comes up where the government has not been accountable, where something occurs that should be investigated and it's not investigated, or at least not investigated independently, then I think that the, seizing upon those moments and, and raising the indignation of the community um, will keep this issue alive. It, it's not likely to go away. Uh, time and time again, issues crop up, uh, as I say, which require investigation, which require independent investigation, and it does not occur. Time and time again, ministers uh, are required to be accountable, but they're not. So I think that it's up to you and all the people who support you to keep the issue alive in that way. It's also interesting, just before we finish, just to note that the ABC in its Australia Talk survey, which was released this week, um, identified that there's a very, there's a vast majority of people in Australia want to see a National Integrity Commission and do have a very low level of trust in the government um, and in politicians. And one of the results of the survey was, I think, that it was something very high, like over 80% of people believe that if, if a politician lies or misleads parliament, then they should be sacked. <laughs> so there's a great deal of understanding, I think, that there is a lot of problems at the top level of government and, and, a, and a real problem with trust in, in those who are governing us, which is, again, a, another problem for uh, the fraying around the edges of democracy. If people don't feel like democracy is working for them, then they kind of lose interest and give up. And I know that you're doing a lot of work at the Centre for Public Integrity and there's other bodies around as well who are working towards that. So very grateful for everything you're doing in that space. And um, thank you very much for the update and we'll talk to you again soon, I'm sure. Thanks very much. Thanks, very much. Thanks everybody for listening in. Uh, I hope everybody, everybody. realises that this is a very important topic and uh, it's only with the community's weight behind it that we will achieve what needs to be achieved.
and restore our democracy to its greatest height. Thank you, Anthony. Enjoy your weekend. We'll talk Thank again you. soon. Okay. All right. Bye. Bye.